Okay, I'd like to call this um, South Burlington City Council and South Burlington Planning Commission joint um, meeting to order. Um, it's Tuesday, February 11th, 2020, and our first order of business is a Pledge of Allegiance. Jessica, you want to start that for us, please? Um, I pledge allegiance, allegiance to the flag of the United States, States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Before we go to item two, I want to apologize to the audience. It's very weird to have my back to you. Um, but we're going to have a lot of presentations, and this is really designed as a conversation between the Planning Commission and the City Council, so it got organized this way in addition to the filming so the public can get a better sense, I guess, of our expressions or something, rather than, and the audiences at the same time. So um, I apologize. This. I don't know if that's of my better side or not, but whatever. <laughs> it's the side to get tonight. Okay, um, item two, instructions on exiting the building in case of emergency. Uh, in case of an emergency tonight, folks, please leave the building by one of these two doors that will take you out into the parking lot. Proceed into the parking lot behind the building to the south of us and gather there. Um, in case for one reason or another these exits are blocked, go back out into the lobby and out the front door and around to the same parking lot to the south. Uh, we have other people in the building. Paul Connor and I will make sure that the building is clear. So everybody please leave expeditions in case of an emergency. <coughs> Thank you. Item three is the agenda review. Are there any additions, deletions, or changes in order of agenda items? that anyone has. Seeing none, um, we'll go on to item four, which is comments and questions from the public not related to the agenda. Are there any? Okay, seeing, seeing none. Um, item five is the consent agenda for the city council. And we have one item to authorize the city manager to negotiate and sign an agreement with the recommended consultant, Stantec, to design and engineer the shared use plan on the south end of the Dorset Street project. So I would entertain a motion for approval. I moved. And a second? second? Is there any discussion? Okay, all in. Do we oh. Uh, I do not right now, but I will find that out and get back to you. Uh, I think that'll come up in the discussions once we choose. We lock into a company. Okay. Uh, could we just note that it will close the gap between Nolan Farm Drive and Old Cross Road and Sadie Lane? That might be just for the public's information since we've okay. discussed. I know Tom will support this. He's yes, been <laughs> anxious for this little piece to get uh, moving. I could also recuse, but. No, 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 no. We all will use it. Okay, if there's no further discussion, um, all in favor? Uh, Aye. So you. that is passed. We'll move on to item six, which is the Planning Commission presentation followed by a joint discussion of approach to and status of the land development regulation amendments prioritized as part of interim zoning. And before we start that, I just would like to make a few opening um, comments to really help clarify for the public um, why we organized and have are having a joint meeting on this um, topic. So the purpose of this joint meeting is for the council to understand the Planning Commission's perspective about where they are with vetting the IZ reports and potentially drafting uh, land use regulations that reflect those findings. We need to hear where they are with draft regulations for the PUDs. We need to understand if you require additional time to meet your expectations of final and approved PUD language for land um, development regulations. Additionally, we'll hear the status on the studies related to economic assessment of conservation and development 
and finally discuss and assess this information to determine if interim zoning should be extended. Clearly, there are different points of view on what's best or needed. And I suspect the spectrum swings from stop all development on open space to we have enough already. No additional regulations are needed. The balance, in my opinion, lies somewhere in between. I'm hoping we can find that. But I ask that everyone try to really listen, including the public. We tend to only hear what we want to hear. We look for information that supports our biases only, and sometimes we discount the rest. We need to try and understand from the other person's perspective. We need to honor that as valid and find a way to move forward together. This community is all of ours. So let's be civil, respectful, and thoughtful. So Jessica, it's all yours. Okay. Um, so I am Jessica Luisos. I'm the chair of the Planning Commission. Um, I'm going to stand up here so I don't have my back to anyone. Um, not that I'm, I'm not trying to make it more formal than it needs to be, but just the way the room's set up. Otherwise, I um, have my back to some people. So. Um, we are, um, we've been working on many different regulations um, and planning pieces for many years and some of you have been seeing pieces of that along the way. Um, some of that work including the work on protection of natural resources and new regulations for planned unit development um, was included in the interim zoning um, kind of mandate from the council and that has been our big focus so we're going to be talking about where we are with all of that um, I'm going to try to present um, an overview of and touch on a lot of the bigger policy decisions that we've made so far um, we have uh, kind of compiled and affirmed um, most of uh, you know the policy behind what we're presenting tonight but um, Many of these pieces are still in draft format, so this is kind of a direction of where we are, and I'm going to try to update you on kind of where we are on specific pieces, and then uh, there's a presentation of the schedule that we're on um, kind of towards the end. So as I go through, these are kind of guiding uh, policies, and some of which need kind of the deeper dive to get the exact, <coughs> exact language. Um, which is very close um, from our consultants. So uh, the first thing that I wanted to look at was just to bring us back a little bit. So as the Planning Commission, we are working towards implementing the, the city's vision. Um, and the city's vision is outlined in our comprehensive plan. We worked for many years, uh, a few years back, on a, uh, a full override of the comprehensive plan. and. Uh, kind of boiled down with community input and the city council's input at the time into four kind of overarching principles or goals and that's to have a community that's affordable and community strong, walkable, green and clean and opportunity oriented. So as we do our work on the Planning Commission we need to balance each uh, proposed regulation change with how it fits towards the city's goals and that's what we've been trying to do. Um, as well as take uh, kind of continuing input. So um, if we move on, the, uh, this is a map that I think uh, most of you have probably seen. Uh, I know the council's seen it. This was part of our presentation a few year, or a few months back. Um, and I show this now because we're going to use this as kind of a base map uh, to show some additional information uh, throughout tonight's presentation. So, just to give an overview of what we're looking at. So this is the city, the parcels in the city are outlined um, kind of with the gray outlines and then each parcel has been uh, at least generally categorized uh, a few different ways. So the blue parcels are considered to be kind of already built or small. So small means they're less than four acres 
or it's a parcel that's bigger than four acres and has more than 10% impervious surface. It's just a metric to be able to say it's been developed because um, we had to pick something. Um, so the blue is developed. Uh, the various shades of green and yellow um, are various uh, kind of categories of conservation or open space. And then the white parcels are generally the, the larger parcels that are still available for, uh, for development. So, and, th and this isn't a new map. This was um, shown before interim zoning started. And I know that this has been the basis of some of the interim zoning committee work, including uh, the open space committee. Um, so this is kind of the base. So the big thing that we've been working on is how to uh, kind of meet the city's goals. And by doing that, we're looking at a kind of a new structure of development where we're looking at thoughtful patterns. So first off, taking a look at the natural resources on the property. Um, as part of our work, we have some additional, we've done quite a bit of work on uh, what's in our chapter 12, which is the natural resource protection uh, land development standards and looking at um, multiple different types of natural resources um, and in including scenic views which at this point has kind of been pushed into the future we don't have specific new language on that beyond what we have as our current view corridors um, and then once you know what's going on with your natural resources then looking at making sure that we have efficient infrastructure that we can maintain and really use our land well um, and create the communities that we want to live in. So a lot of this um, kind of piggybacks on the back of the work that was done for the form-based code and city center. You know, at the time we did a lot of visioning throughout the city um, and there was a lot of interest in place making and community making, not just in city center, but throughout the city. So as part of that, what we're trying to do is create um, some change in our land development standards that's going to get us towards creating the great neighborhoods that we've visioned and we have information and details about in our comprehensive plan but haven't quite gotten that into our land development regulations yet. So we have multiple approaches that we're taking towards changes to land development regulations. Um, I know we've sometimes called this project the PUD project. PUDs are planned unit developments and that is one form of development um, that can be done uh, through our land development regulations, but our project is actually a bigger than that. And, um, you know, one of the biggest things is that with any new development that would come before the city, um, there'd first be a look at the context of, of the, the area, the parcel, and taking a look at the natural resources on the parcel. Um, you know, identifying connections, what things are next door, and um, kind of then from there going, um, making sure that things are thoughtfully integrated. So one piece of that is PUDs, so then we'd have a PUD type if it would be that type of development, um, and really making sure that um, the process takes into account neighbor neighborhood making components. So, um, so as I was saying, planned unit developments are one piece of this. Um, we're also proposing um, changes to a traditional subdivision. Um, so making sure that in a, tr a traditional subdivision, um, you also have some place making uh, components included, as well as some um, changes to the master plan. So I know that this chart is not readable, but the idea is just that, um, you know, we're kind of incorporating these community aspects into subdivision regulations, planned unit development regulations, and master planning, which would come into play if there's multiple phases to a, um, a development. So PUD types. So I know there's a lot of words up here. and. What this basically means is that when, we're, when a development would come forward as a planned unit development, um, right now our planned unit development regulations are often used as a, uh, a way to get a waiver. Um, 
there's a lot of flexibility, but our standards are relatively loose in kind of what the city and the community is getting um, in exchange for that flexibility. So the new regulations that we're proposing would specify kind of predictable development patterns. And with that, there's uh, four different types of kind of neighborhood patterns that could be chosen. So four different PUD types. Um, and the idea is that each one of these would have a certain type of development pattern um, that would be done in a predictable way. So the four categories are traditional neighborhood development. We'll dive into that a little bit as an example with a few slides. Um, then also the neighborhood center, the conservation, and the campus business park. So each of those, we can go on to the next slide. So each of these um, would have a few different components. So as an example, so the traditional neighborhood development, um, you know, there's a picture of what it might look like here, and then a land use allocation. So for each of the PUD types, um, there's an allocation of how the land would be uh, kind of broken up. So in this case, uh, the yellow would be residential, so in this one it would be mostly residential, but still have kind of non-residential components. Um, open space, and open space also would include um, some resource land um, and some civic space, so that's kind of placemaking items, so an area of land that's set aside for, for communal use. Um, and then unallocated, there's some flexibility in each of these. So unallocated land could go um, kind of into any of the other categories to provide some flexibility. Um, so kind of to have the specificity just gives more um, <coughs> predictability on both sides as to what, um, you know, what the development might look like. So zooming out, I know that not all of these details are exactly readable, but you know you have the four types, and you can see generally that the land uh, allocation changes based on the pie chart, where um, the conservation PUD at the top kind of has a, a larger uh, open space or civic space allocation. Uh, you know, the campus and the neighborhood commercial center have more of the blue, which is the, the commercial or non-residential lands. And then kind of a look at, within each of those categories, what the breakdown might be. Um, with looking at, uh, you know, so in the tip neighborhood development, uh, you know, there's an allocation of types of housing as well. So single and two family versus multifamily, um, you know, to have a, a mix. So some of those percentages are still under discussion. So this is a repeat of the previous slide just to kind of bring us back into thinking of this um, across the city. So um, the idea here is that um, if developed, the parcels that are shown in white would follow a PUD type of development to have kind of that predictable, smart, community-based development. Um, on them. And then the smaller parcels would, you know, blue, so say some of the smaller parcels that are here shown in blue might be redeveloped, you know, if they were, they would need to use the updated um, subdivision standards. And then any parcels across the city that would be uh, proposed for development would need to adhere to the new natural resource protection standards that would be in Chapter 12 and apply citywide. So looking at the natural resources, um, we have a, a little bit different approach to what's currently in our zoning. Um, <coughs> many of the uh, natural resources we're talking about are, are in, the, in the regulations already with a few additions I'll get into on the next slide. But the idea is that there is a um, kind of a hierarchy of how they're treated. And um, hazards are um, traditionally uh, regulated, most of which have a hazard component, so they're typically they're 
floodplains, um, wetlands, things like that. And we'll look at the list in a second. But the idea is that those would be a no-build area um, and would not count towards buildable land density. So they would be taken out of density calculations. So there's, there would be no buildings on them, no, no development on them, and they wouldn't count towards buildable area. Um, there could be potentially some what we call restricted infrastructure uh, encroachment you know, in places where there's no other access. Or, or something like that. Maybe there's a utility crossing that needs to happen because there's no other options. Um, in the <laughs> what is that? Uh, it's the pipes for the cleaners. Okay, good. Just the pipes. <laughs> uh, so, and there there's specific criteria uh, written in what actually would qualify for that encroachment. So then looking at other resources, level one and level two resources are additional resources that are um, kind of valued by the community for a variety of reasons. Um, and we've broken them into level one and level two. Uh, level one being very similar to hazards, they would have limited impact for infrastructure. Um, in PUDs, the land, it would be included for density calculations, but in subdivisions, they would not be counted towards density calculations. Um, and then level two resources, there's um, specific language on types of encroachment, um, kind of where on the property those would be located, and they would be prioritized for the open space allocation um, that you saw in the, the previous pie charts. So here we are back at a citywide map. Um, the pink color represent the hazards, and you can see the list of them there. Floodplains, uh, class two wetlands and buffers, streams and setbacks, um, and those have been uh, regulated in our, um, our standards already. What we're adding is um, some a new language on exactly how the top of bank is calculated on a plan. And then we recently added river corridors, um, and that has been adopted a few months ago. And steep slopes are um, proposed to be part of those resources as well. And then level one resources in the red, uh, we have habitat blocks um, and another category of steep slopes shown on there. So just to show what we're calling habitat blocks, um, I thought it would be important to actually show, um, show this now. We're not going to get into this. Uh, this is actually part of number nine on the agenda to find an additional meeting time to really delve into the results of this report. It was done by Arrowwood. Um, it was done by Arrowwood, a consultant. We got the results very recently. And I think we're going to have a, an additional joint meeting where we could um, actually hear from the consultant the specific details of this and really delve into it. But um, so that was shown in red on the previous map, and we're going to have a follow-up discussion focused on that piece. So the next slide. Um, so what does this look like all together? Um, so this was the map that we had looked at previously. Now with the hazards in level one. Um, overlaid on top. So this is generally for reference. Um, some of the um, some of the resources would be field delineated and might change a little bit. So some of these are approximations of what they look like. Um, so there are still white areas left, some of which have been kind of covered up by some of the natural resources. And I think we can go to the next slide. So just to start to look at what this might look like on a specific property, I mean, we know no properties are really shaped like this. This is obviously um, generic development parcel. So the idea is that the orange represents the hazards. So those would be our floodplains, wetlands, river corridors where there would be no development, um, and the area would be excluded from density calculations. 
Um, there may be some exceptions to that we've been talking about with, you know, if you use a conservation PUD type. Then we have level one resources shown in the green. Um, so that could be the habitat areas or steep slopes. And, you know, so this would be no development except infrastructure. <coughs> and the density might be able to be used other places depending on the, um, the type of development going on. So we said that there, we're proposing a difference between if you use a traditional subdivision versus a PUD and how that's calculated. Then we have kind of a blue strip in the middle that represents the level two resources. So the idea is that some of those, um, depending on the case and the individual resource, may actually be kind of part of the area of the property that's considered um, developable. Um, but there's kind of specifics on, on each type of resource there. And then the remainder of the parcel, parcel would be developable per the zoning. So, um, you know, either through the PUD or the traditional subdivision development. So if we start to look at this, uh, what all the numbers mean, um, I know that those pie charts we looked at before are a little difficult. So here's an example for the traditional neighborhood development. So this is a um, hypothetical 50 acre parcel. So we have a chart up here at the top, which the first little part of it seems to be cut off. But what you can't see is right up there it says hazards 10 acres. So the idea is that this parcel has 10 acres that are hazards, maybe a floodplain. And then there's two acres that are a level one resource, so maybe that's a habitat block. And now, what does that mean for the rest of the numbers? So, so now we're looking here. So we have um, our we have our 50 acres. We have 10 acres of hazards, two acres of level one resource. So there's 40 acres of developable land on the parcel. So then, going back to our PUD type, there's allocations of land. Um, for that developable land. So uh, that's kind of looking at this chart here um, and this pie chart. So of that, there's 70% residential. So that's kind of our big blue area. So of the land, there'd be then 28 acres residential um, and an even distribution of the other types of non-residential open space and unallocated, which could be allocated to any of the different land uses. Then kind of delving a little bit deeper so that we don't have kind of monoculture developments, there's some allocations of types of buildings and types of residential units within that so that there's a range of housing types um, as well as just the fact that it's housing. Um, and then also within the, the civic space or open space, kind of a distribution of kind of a more developed kind of civic space, park space versus uh, more of kind of an open space natural resource element. So a, a piece of this that uh, is also new is the idea of uh, minimum density as well as maximum density. Our current uh, land development regulations um, use maximum density. Um, where uh, you might hear that the land is allowed to have four units per acre, so that would be a maximum. So what we're proposing, um, in order to really have efficient use of our developed land, so in areas where we're, we're impacting and we're making the commitment as a city to run utilities and sewer and water to those locations, we want to make sure that that's really um, used efficiently so we're proposing to have a minimum density at all, uh, as well. Um, which, in our opinion, you know, if there's kind of a range of a minimum density and a maximum density, it gives kind of everyone in the community a, uh, a little bit more predictability about what they may expect on the land, um, both from a tax base as well as neighbors being able to know kind of the range of what kind of development might be able to be uh, nearby. So. There are some notes here on how those are calculated. Um, maximum density is kind of what we're used to for the most part. So it's the 50 acres, you know, the, the area of the land. In this case, we're talking about subtracting the hazards. So that would be spots where 
it would be dangerous um, or kind of unreasonable develop, to develop. So that's the floodplains, the wetlands, the other things I've listed under hazards. So you'd subtract out that and take that times the um, available density for the land. So in this case, in this table, <coughs> we put in four units per acre here. So we had our 50 acres, 40 are developable, times four units per acre, and that gets to us to 160 units, which is the maximum density. So for our minimum density, um, what we did uh, kind of in this, in this draft for your comment is took the, um, the total area and then subtracted out both the hazards and the level one, so kind of this whole area, and took our developable area times the four units per acre. Oh no, yeah, times the 70% residential. So it's basically this piece of the pie times the four units per acre. You know that this is a concept. So, so is it 70% of the dark blue? 70% of the dark blue is this medium blue. That's what that yes. is. So that whole pie represents how you're dividing up the developable property. Yes. The 112? So the 112 is the, yes, homes, units. Yes, so these four acres, uh, ratios, acres, units per acre, and then units. Sorry, we didn't have all of the, they're not all labeled very well. And we don't need feedback right this minute, but this is something that is new. There's a few new concepts here. That's the traditional neighborhood. Right, and that's through the traditional neighborhood development. So there's four, <coughs> there's four different PUD types, and um, the general idea is similar. The percentages um, would be different. And then, obviously, the weighted units, uh, the underlying density changes depending on where you are in the city. So, you know, there are some spots where, you know, it's seven units per acre or 12, you know, there's different, we just picked a, an example. So one four. more question, just so I understand the graph. So that little square that has the residential unit distribution, is that the allocation for that lighter blue? Um, so those are the types of houses? Yeah, so see this, this kind of medium blue? Medium blue, yeah. Um, the medium blue, the 28 acres, is then split up into single family, attached, multifamily, and some flexibility. Thank you. Um, so in addition to having um, the land allocated uh, in the way that we just talked about, there's also uh, what we would call kind of design standards or, or types of um, a few different things. So. We have some examples here of what those look like. Um, so the specific types, in this case, we're looking at open space types. Um, there are graphics and examples um, as well as specific details. So in the open space area, you know, there's a general um, chart. It has types, you know, plaza, green, pocket park, kind of which of the PUDs, these would be acceptable in, and then specific details on what each of those includes. And then for each of those open space types, like a whole sheet that describes kind of what needs to be included. Are there benches? What size does it need to be? Does there need to be shade trees? Are there picnic tables? Like what, what kinds of things you would expect in that type of open space? This is very similar to what we have um, already in city center. Uh, that we've been using already. Um, so what these are, you know, now we're looking at street types. So for each of these typologies, we took um, what's already being used in city center, kind of expanded the options, um, included some additional graphics uh, to make it more applicable to other areas of the city. Um, you know, some of these type choices were relatively narrow because we were really just talking about city center the first time we put this together. So now there's more um, options that are kind of more applicable to rural areas. The idea is that these kind of charts and details on the types would be applicable um, eventually across the city, 
not just in city center and the PUDs where we're talking about having this apply now. Um, so then the last kind of typology on the next slide is the street types. Um, you know, so with street types, we have things like where are sidewalks, what are the bike accommodations, um, charts on kind of where things lay out as well as dimensions. <coughs> so then we also have building types. Um, so there's, there's a lot shown on here. This is actually three sheets. So there's a row house, townhouse sheet, a cottage cluster sheet, and a neighborhood storefront sheet. So the idea is that there may be um, a certain number of building types that might be applicable in different areas of the city or different PUD types. Um, maybe not all. Oh, yeah, so Paul just mentioned this is, this is a type, not an architectural review, so we're not going to have like the design, a design review or architectural review. You know, there's just kind of general types. Um, so this is, I know, completely unreadable, but so at our level, um, I just want to say, so all, everything we just looked at has been kind of reviewed in pieces. Um, the PUD, the text of the PUD um, types we've reviewed in kind of outline form. Um, the consultant has been working and with staff extremely hard to get us the, the actual LLDR language um, associated with these, and we're expecting to get that uh, in the next two weeks. Um, what consultant are you working with? It's uh, we are working with two that are working together. One is um, Front Porch Community <coughs> Planning and Design, which is Sharon Murray, and the other is Mark Kane, Bessie Um So uh, all the pieces we've been kind of working on in pieces, and we're, we're close to having it all completely together. And um, so Helen did uh, ask um, for me to work with staff to see uh, kind of where we are on the timeline and where we could be in the next short bit of time. Um, this is, so this is new over the weekends. So the Planning Commission has not seen this timeline yet, so this is, this is new information right here. Um, I was asked if we could be done and ready for adoption in 90 days, because obviously we're not ready for adoption tonight, so that's not news, I guess. <laughs> based on what I just said. But um, so we have two different timelines we're looking at here. So this is a little complicated. So we start in February where we are tonight. We come across uh, May through June. Um, we have the top line is our aggressive schedule. Um, and then we have a very aggressive 90-day schedule. Um, I guess I feel like um, from talking with, with <coughs> staff and really thinking through what we typically do with public outreach, I feel like the 90-day schedule is not realistic. I think we wouldn't have the opportunity to have the appropriate amount of public feedback and, and legal review and everything that goes into um, you know, really making sure that we're, we're on board with our decisions. Um, so I think I would say that you know, the aggressive schedule, which is the top line, which has us uh, kind of bringing you something in June is, is probably more in line with our fast track at this point. We want to make sure that we have kind of the time um, to really get public input, and which we need to do. Uh, so even this aggressive schedule would require m multiple additional meetings. It would require kind of a different approach that we often have to public input. So what we would be envisioning with the aggressive approach is to have um, kind of a series of listening sessions with the public on specific topics. Um, we may not be able to do that uh, within our typical meeting schedule, so that may be kind of subsets of us kind of focusing on some of those specific topics. Um, sometimes with our public input, we wind up having a lot of uh, back and forth, like answering questions in the moment. Um, you know, I feel like with this aggressive schedule, we're not going to necessarily be able to have that 
back and forth that I, I know you're good at your level of not doing that, of kind of taking input and then, you know, having a discussion. I think we're going to try to do that um, with this, with moving forward. And I think it would also take us not uh, kind of continually going back and revisiting a lot of topics, kind of once we've kind of gone through something and reviewed it and gotten public input, having that be where we're at on something. Um, and, you know, I, I think sometimes we can take a really long time and get to a point where we're 100% unanimous and we're, everything's perfect and we've had 10 analyses on things and that's where we love to be for you <laughs> so that by the time it gets to you there's no questions left. Um, so the aggressive schedule might not have us at that point. It might have us at the point where we have a majority, We've been talking about it for two years. We feel quite good, but um, you know, you might still have questions, but which sometimes is the way things go. So I, I just wanted to be clear that the aggressive schedule is aggressive, and um, kind of what that might mean for us with extra meetings and some lessening sessions. So let's see. So there are some things that we have talked about having a commitment to as next steps, knowing that not every single thing we'd love to do we can always do at one time. So we have a, a phase two components, um, including the things listed up here. So a scorecard for PUDs, uh, making some changes to the underlying zoning districts <coughs> to really make sure that the underlying zoning districts are, are perfectly matched with the PUDs and our new requirements. Um, continuing to work on small lot subdivisions. Uh, a lot of the PUDs and things we've been working at are kind of for larger areas um, with the land allocation the way it is. So there might be some work that needs to be done to make sure that makes sense for smaller lots. Um, as I talked about with the building and open space types, we love the idea of having that apply citywide and not just in the PUDs. Um, looking at some additional updates to the site plan standards. And then in Chapter 12 at this point, we have some reserve sections. We um, had gotten feedback from the City Council and some other committees um, a few years ago that, about looking at some scenic views. And that's been kind of on the side burner for a long time. So you know, actually looking at some of those is on the next steps list. And then the Planning Commission recommendations from the Transfer of Development Rights um, Report. So those would be our committed next steps. And just to follow up on that last item, um, back in December you got, uh, you received the, your, your TDR committee's uh, report. And you had asked at that point for us as the planning commission to kind of look through those recommendations and come up with some steps um, for what our short-term next steps would be from the report recommendations. Um, this was in your packet, so this is not new information. You should have gotten this um, on Friday. Um, so we took um, the TDR committee's finished work. Uh, I ended with a list of recommendations. Um, so the Planning Commission kind of reviewed those recommendations in balance with um, kind of the other comprehensive goals and, and work we're doing um, and voted on a modified subset so so there are some additional uh, recommendations from that report that actually fall more within kind of your purview at the city council level so we focused on the ones that were specific to the land development regulations um, kind of in this list um, as kind of a, a path for the next steps so we're not going to get into this in great detail tonight but know that this is the the approach that we want to kind of move forward with after we get through our very aggressive next uh, few months on the PUDs to finish that work up. Um, so, and just as an acknowledgement, some we got a lot of feedback while we were talking about the um, the TDR recommendations. There were a few of them that referred to the open space report and the parcels. Um, and kind of at our last meeting, we were very clear that um, you know the TDR report came out before the open space report, so those recommendations weren't uh, meshed perfectly. So uh, one of the uh, items here, where is it? 
so yes, yeah, three A. Three. So yeah. land within parcels identified by the Open Space IZ Committee as priority for conservation could be um, an optional sending area. So within this, um, we weren't kind of mandating any TDR change um, on those parcels. So you know there was some confusion as to how the two IZ kind of reports were going to mesh together. That's where we came up with. So this is definitely for additional work, um, <coughs> not for a lot for today. So I guess the, yeah. So it's, so the other interim zoning um, committee, the one on open space, has um, finished their final report, presented it both to you and to us. Uh, we have received quite a few um, questions on kind of what our path forward for this is. Um, I know we're not going to get into a lot of detail tonight, but because we heard a lot of feedback on this, we thought it would be important. So just uh, an overlay of the pre one of the previous maps. So we, I showed earlier the hazards and the level one resources in the pink and the red. And just for reference, the... Um, the parcels that were identified in the open space committee were are now kind of overlaid over that in blue, just so you can kind of see how they might um, kind of fit together. Um, so I think that this is probably a discussion for our future joint meeting um, when we will be talking about the Ira Wood parcels and kind of if you have other tools you might want to use for conservation. Um, but as part of kind of our list of kind of affirmed approaches, it was in your packet. Um, just to be clear on what we're recommending for our work um, related to these is that um, the portions of the parcels, so not the parcel, but the portions of the parcels that are delineated as natural resources and regulated under chapter 12 would be just that, regulated under chapter 12. Um, so from our perspective as the Planning Commission, we're not planning on using the parcel boundary as a delineation of a natural resource. Um, and then we recommend that the City Council review the parcels um, with the results of the, um, the Earth Economics report that you're going to be getting back and consider if there's additional conservation tools that you at your level might be interested in pursuing, um, you know, that are outside the LDR, so if appropriate. So, so that was, I know there was some confusion. I know anytime people see something on a map, um, it, uh, you know, you can jump to conclusions, but that's for, for the regulation of the natural resources, that's, that's where we are. Okay, and this is um, our generic parcel that says what I just said, hopefully. So, um, so say in this case our generic parcel happens to be one of the parcels identified in the report. Um, what we would be doing as the Planning Commission, just like any other parcel, the hazards would be regulated, level one would be regulated, uh, the level two resources would be regulated to the extent that they're regulated, um, and then the remainder of the parcel um, could be developed using our exciting new PUD tools and, um, or potentially um, with your work you may choose a different to pursue a different path for some of those so you know whether that's work from the Earth economics report or looking at the comprehensive goals there may be some kind of other action on your end open space fund or um, or otherwise so so that I think is kind of a, a, a precursor to kind of a future meeting when you might have all of that information I think that's it, that's it. so thank you I'm, I'm sorry this was more of a presentation than I like to do but are there any questions that are you know burning I thought that was very clear and helpful. I have 
five questions, but I'd keep us here all night, so I'm going to write an email afterwards to Jessica. It's basically, basically on the hazard land exclusion. I'm just curious if that's a, a departure from our current practice, and I'm also really interested to understand these minimums more, so if what we have now and what the possible implications are from forcing TDR acquisition. But I don't want to keep us here all evening, and I'd love to hear uh, from some of the public. So, so um, I think we have five minutes until your public hearing starts. So I can answer the minimum question. So we did want to make sure that no one would be required to buy a TDR to meet the minimum. So the minimum would never be more <coughs> than the, um, the as right. So, so that one was easy. Anything else from... I guess I, I would love to see some sort of a tight summary on what you would call winners and losers. So, if you if you held if you were holding a piece of land in the city right now, um, and it crossed several of these boundaries, how would that change the, the potential development of that site? You know, would it be fewer units or the same number of units, but they had to be smaller because they had to be in a smaller space? Uh, but you know, a, a, an advantage could be more open space. Uh, another disadvantage might be fewer TDRs potentially sold off that because you're eliminating the hazard. So that kind of a summary that says these are the changes that are going to affect different people in different ways. I mean, nice to see that summarized. But staying within her timeline that she put it uh, on. I'm just saying, I'd, I'd well, like to see that at some point. I mean, yeah. maybe one of your future publishers. So we've, we've, that is something we've talked about, how oh, the effects, and that, that's an analysis that I think for us to be comfortable with putting some, something forward, we want to have an idea of kind of exactly what those are also. That's why we can't do it in 90 days, I think was the, that was, we just want to make sure we have time to do what you're saying. So what you're saying is you need six months till June? Is that, is that right? If everybody's okay January. with January. Yeah. Yeah. Quite six. Yeah, it's not quite six. Yeah, it's not quite yeah. six. Yeah. It's four and a half. Four and a half months. But in your yeah. time Extra line, meetings? Didn't you complete it possibly by June? 28th, the end, I think, was what it... Third? Oh, 23rd. Yeah. A hundred and... So, I, I mean, it might wind up being a meeting or maybe a listening session where we're not all there, but weekly something. And that would only be the PUD project. Yes, I understand. This, this is just the PUD. And these PUDs could be, in fact, approved outside of interim zoning. That is a possibility. That is not against the rules or the law, correct? They would apply citywide, um, regardless of areas that the city has designated as interim zoning or not interim zoning. If the, the commission's charge from the beginning was to look citywide at the applicability. But even if interim zoning ended tonight, you could still enact these PUDs. Right, but between the time we end IZ and they're enacted, the old rules rule. So, so it would not be these. Clarification on it. So um, interim zoning as a tool exists for this reason. So the idea where we've kind of put all our cards out there um, so that there's not a develop it, development like scramble to like get in under the wire. So I'm not saying that you should do something one way or the other, but the, the, the specific tool um, exists for the reason where we've kind of talked about a new development um, plan or new regulation to kind of give time to um, enact it so that's just to piggyback on that um, on this chart you'll see the last thing on each of them is City Council hearing notice that's the day in which um, new regulations are legally in effect so when when you vote to, to put it to hold a public hearing and then it gets published in the other paper the day it's published in the other paper is the day it's in effect of pending your action so that's why this timeline goes to there do you have any reason to believe there would be a scramble like is that historically something that happens i i don't i don't know but i i do know that the tool exists so that that doesn't happen so i think sometimes it happens i don't I, mean, I, don't I can know. give an example. I mean, we just went through a tremendous amount of work putting forward the inclusionary uh, 
uh, inclusionary zoning. That was a tremendous amount of work. And if you look at the timing that's required for the public hearings that we can't control, um, with the inclusionary process, there was an incredible amount of feedback that came in from the public, from the development community, from landowners, that was very valuable to that process. And it made the end product, I think everyone would agree, it made the end product much better. So having the feedback during those times does result in, I wouldn't call it a scramble, but important improvements <coughs> that come from that feedback. And if that is compromised or if people, you know, it, that, that's where a, an overall policy can miss some opportunities to be as, as thorough and beneficial as possible, so. Tom, in response to that, the, <laughs> The um, Planning Commission at their last meeting, uh, a resident stood up and said, when IZ ends, I'm working with a group of those 25 property owners and we will be ready to submit proposals for development. I don't recall that. Do you know who said that? I, I, I do. And it was um, corroborated in a phone call after by Alan Strong. It was Michael Simino. I don't know who the group was he's working with, but he literally said, this is my plan. So that, in Mike my Simino mind... is sitting in this room, and it's the first time he's heard that, okay? Huh. So we, we, I loved your opening speech about the open mind. I'm asking these questions to truly, because I, I have an open that. mind, and I'm trying to understand the applicability and the requirement and necessity of interim zoning. So I, don't, I don't, this is news to me, and I just want to understand if a scramble is truly something we need to fear, if there's precedent for it. So I have an open mind on this. We had precedent the last, IZ. Yes. There was a scramble for development? I know what he's okay. talking about. I don't know. We, have, we have an email, I believe, um, and yes. people Mike came sent forward as well, that, stating that. So, I mean, I think that's a real possibility. And that's the whole point of the interim zoning law to avoid that. So okay. I think if we close the door before things are in place, <coughs> a lot of this work might be for naught. Yes, they could keep going on it, but, it, you know, it wouldn't apply to everyone. If you look at that schedule, uh, I, may, I look back, I've been on the commission for 25 years, but I look back and the project started in August of 2016 uh, when the consultants um, presented their phase one uh, report. That's almost four years ago. So this is not an easy project to complete and Jessica has said it's aggressive. Um, and it surely is. Um, and I have some doubts, given what I've observed, uh, that it can be done by June. We will try like hell to do it. But, um, you know, this, um, this subject has been on the Planning Commission agendas more than 25 times in, since the middle of 2018. So we, we've worked at it, but it's still not done. I'd like to offer two two points, mm -hmm. and one is because um, uh, I understand a little bit about this other working group, and I actually think it's a great idea. Okay, um, so I want to tell you what I know about that working group, which is an unofficial group. But the second thing that I would say is that now these minimums is an example. Okay, and I've tried to personally explain this when when we're in public <coughs> meetings. There are it might be worth very worth the time of landowners to allow this process to complete, especially in defining minimums and maximums, because it will make their process simpler. If that is not worked out in advance, what so many people have been working with, and it's been a frustration to both the people developing and the people that are upset about the development, is that there's a misunderstanding about what should and should not be allowed. And this process is going to streamline that. If this process, it will anyway when it's done, 
but any project that doesn't wait for this to happen will be in that same boat. And they're going to go and try to do something, and they won't have a minimum written in the book to work with. So that, that, that's, that will be their option to deal with. So I'm just putting that out as an example of why it's, there are benefits, I think, to everyone involved to let these new, um, this new work come to fruition, I, I, is the hope. And the second thing I would just add about this working group, which I think really is very smart, is that I, it gets to this white and blue area of the map, which I think will, there was a lot of stress in the community when they saw the parcels, thinking that an entire parcel was going to be pulled. And we've all made it very clear that that's not what any regulations that we're working on will include. And from what I understand, this working group, which is actually made of a very diverse group, is looking at, of those parcels, I will interpret it as saying, what are those white and blue areas and what might have the greatest opportunity? So it's not, I think it's actually a very smart follow-up and it happens to be a volunteer group. That's my understanding of it. Um, so I just wanted to put those two things out there. Thank you. It really underscores the importance of the minimum and the maximum number, which currently does not exist. And I think that is a question that's been in many people's minds. How many more units are we going to build? I think that's a really, I think, useful <coughs> of, of detail. Okay, I think this is a logical time to go into the open here, uh, the um, public hearing. It's scheduled for 7:30 to 8 o'clock. And it's, we're five minutes late, but I think all of this conversation is helpful for that. So I would entertain a motion to open a public hearing um, related to hear comments related to the possible extension of interim zoning in those areas currently covered. So moved. Second? Okay. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Pardon? Discussion. Is there any discussion about going having a public hearing? I just want to thank the Planning Commission for that presentation and look forward to the discussion. And I want to thank you for all your hard work and what looks like future hard work. It really does. Whether or not we have interim zoning or not, this PUD plan, I think, really is very important. Okay. So are you ready to vote now? Okay, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, so we will open the public hearing. Can we recon are you planning you to stay? For are you done? You're gonna stay though, right? I think our meeting's still going. Yeah. But oh, so you'll be part of the public audience. hearing too. So we should turn okay. around though. Table, oh, that would be good. What are you suggesting, Kevin, that we move over We're going to move I'm this move up there. Up. You guys stay here. You stay here? Yeah. Everybody stay while there are. Should we span out a little bit? Sure. Yeah. yeah. I mean, you'd like to see it. Just don't want to knock it the, the table. Sorry. the other side. You turn it to. <laughs> Yeah, I was, I was okay. exactly. Sure. I've had my dose of sugar for the day. Um, so, I think Ellen and Megan are going to be talking about Ellen and Jessica are going to be here. These belong to Jessica and Helen. <laughs> yeah, you're dealing with Oh, yeah, are we going to have a little table for the public? And we need a mic, too. Hmm. I'd like to turn it just a little bit more. Is that possible? You're good at this, Charlie. I trust you. <laughs> I probably will. <laughs> okay, so can I um, have some quiet and can I have a, a show of hands of how many people would like to comment? Understanding will limit. And it doesn't mean you 
If you don't raise your hand now, could you just keep them up so I can count just briefly so we get an idea? One, two, three, four, five, seven, eight. It looks like about 16 or 17 people, and there possibly will be more. So I would like to set a limit of two minutes so we can get through this, and I think some of it might be could possibly be repetitive, so try not to do that so we get sort of a full spectrum of thought. And I have a timer. So um, why don't you start, please. Please state your name and um, your comments briefly. Um, a lot of community members have volunteered a lot of time. And I think it would be foolish to end IZ right now and let all of their work go to waste before their recommendations are implemented. Um, last time with IZ, it was really a fail because nothing came of it. So I know that for people that, you know, like the developers that want to go forward, they, you know, are frustrated. But if we look at the future of South Burlington, which is a pretty long time, three months or six months or whatever it is, is really just a blink compared to the future of South Burlington, which I think is really important. And it's obvious that there's a lot of community members that are really having a lot to say about this. Not a lot of people like public speaking. I sure don't. But it is important <coughs> enough for me to say that I have to speak up to say that we really need to pay attention and let the committees finish and implement what they're saying for the future of our city. So. Thank you. Um, someone else? I just have a question. Yes, please. Peter Kahn, um, question to the Planning Commission on that you had the four different PUD types. How are those determined uh, as far as like what type goes with what area? That is a good question. So we have, there is a, different zoning districts are going to have different ones that are applicable. So it, not all, like if it's um, like Shelburne Road, it might, conservation might not make sense. So, so we, I don't know, do we have a good map available for that? So would that be a zoning? So that would be a, a rezoning into that PUD type applied to that you know, region? Is that? But usually, I mean, we've talked about having choices. Too. So choices of different PUD types on the same in the same area. Generally, it, on, it, it is supposed to relate to what is the zoning district today. So if it's a district where you can build four units an acre, that tends to line up with a traditional neighborhood. Mm -hmm. If it's a Shelburne Road area where it's eight <coughs> or twelve units an acre, then it tends to be a neighborhood commercial. That's the way the map kind of lines up. And then there's some areas that are sort of seven or eight <coughs> units an acre, like along Kennedy Drive, and that might be a bridge between where it could be one way or the other way. That's kind of what, how the commission's looked at. Okay, so so it would be it would be, um, uh, in, in, uh, it would be uh, uh, it would correlate with the current zoning. To some, Largely, to some yes. Degree. There are a few areas where um, the commission, for the last several years, has been talking about making changes. But those those are generally in the areas that are really super fuzzy on the. That first, the comprehensive plan future land use map, like those are some of the areas where there's some changes being talked about. Well, and Jessica, the conservation PUD, which we didn't get into in detail though, is a great example of how everyone, this can all come together very nicely and that, that as of right now, though it hasn't been finalized, would start when a development parcel it has 50% um, within the hazard and, and level one. And then by using the, con the um, conservation PUD, it immediately gives a lot of clarity about what can happen there. And that's an, a great example of allowing that to be worked out first, I think will bring a lot of clarity to both the development community and the... Would there be a choice on which PUD to use as far as, so if, if it's zoned for a certain PUD, so there, there might be a choice of, of which PUD could be used? I mean, I'm, I'm yes. guessing a lower, like if you wanted to go with a, a lesser yes. impactful yep. PUD, you could choose it as well. That's right. In, in some areas. In it some may areas. not be 
the middle of Shelburne Road may not allow for four units an acre that because the city policy is to have something <coughs> more than that mm -hmm. okay. but some other areas not so not so yeah. much okay thank you all right thank you I'd like to try to keep the questions I think that was a good one but a lot of these questions will be answered as you continue your work on these and sort of stick to the topic of whether we should expand the timeline for um, IZ who would like to be next Mike I hope you can hear me. I've got a cold, so I may not sound too uh, lucid uh, here. Uh, I've had the opportunity to look at the open space report, the TDR report. I've uh, been following the PUDs, uh, anxious to see the cost-benefit analyses that are going to be done. And all of these things are supposed to be, uh, there's an effort being made to kind of integrate them by the Planning Commission and then come up with some recommendations. Uh, and uh, fundamentally, I, I would just like for the council to uh, kind of get straight with everybody out there in the community, those who support interim zoning, those who do not. Uh, I look at the, those studies and I see a lot of heavy lifting left personally when I look at this stuff. Now maybe the PC has got an idea and they're confident that they can expedite this within the time frame that that's up there, but we know that things ordinarily take longer than you think they're going to. So I would like to have the council tell the community right now whether it's their intention to keep interim zoning in place as long as it takes to get this stuff done with these studies uh, up to the three-year period of time that I understand we're limited to having interim zoning by law. I think, it I think that everybody out there in the community would appreciate knowing what your intentions are. Because uh, a few days ago, word on the street was, IZ was done. And there's a little campaign to change people's minds, and now we are pretty sure that it's not done. So just be straight with us. What are your plans? Can you answer that question? Well, hope we will have that conversation and discussion. Thank you. I think that's item um, 10. And that's when we will have that conversation. Next, who would like to speak? Sure. Thank you. Hi, my name is Kelly Lord. And I just want to mention a couple questions I had after hearing the presentation. Um, in the maps, it shows a lot of areas of hazards and level one conservation. And I see a lot of like fragmented colors that all symbolize our natural resources. But going, going pretty far back, we had great presentations about things like the wildlife corridors and the connectivity for wildlife. And I don't understand how when you just look at each parcel um, in isolation and what can happen to that parcel, how the wildlife corridors and the connectivity for wildlife will be protected and preserved and considered throughout this whole process. Um, I'm seeing individual, lots of individual parcels and individual resources being talked about. I'd like to hear more about um, the wildlife corridors that we have in place and how the connectivity is going to be preserved. That's my first question. The second question has to do with the Open Space Committee. Um, I understood that they spent a lot of time um, taking a look at the parcels that are still open in South Burlington and really prioritized um, not just resources, um, individual resources, but which parcels the, the city may want to keep open and left in their natural state. But now what I'm hearing is that the open space report will have really identified those areas but they're not going to be used in any way um, incorporated into LDRs so other than basically serving to sort of tip off developers in terms of ooh, these areas we might want to look at closely right now I'm really wondering how all the work of the volunteers on this committee is going to turn into anything how are these open spaces that are so precious to people in South Burlington going to actually be preserved and maintained as open spaces 
what was the purpose of that committee if it doesn't then take those spaces and not just a portion of those those parcels but those parcels and actually turn it into something that's maintained as open I like to see people volunteer for the city and I'm on one of the committees myself to have their work <coughs> actually turn into something and this is one where I hear yeah this is great we've identified all these parcels but we're actually not going to really do anything with them and we see them on the map but we're actually going to treat them just like any other parcel we're going to break them down into this little quarter has this resource and this can all be developed when the whole purpose of this committee <coughs> was to identify open spaces that were a priority to the city left open completely open not a small piece open but open so that's one thing that I want to mention but you're and and can you wrap this up yep. a little bit and the other comment that was made is that maybe that's not going to be the Planning Commission um, turning that into an LDR but maybe that's gonna go back to the City Council to say okay what are tool what are the tools do we have how can we listen to what our residents are saying and what this committee recommended and say we want to leave this open is not necessarily through an LDR but you have other tools available to you and being on the TR committee we definitely have talked a lot about sending areas receiving areas maybe if these parcels are that important to the residents of South Burlington maybe they should be sending areas not receiving areas maybe somehow these different interim zoning committees can come together and say this this work from the open space committee was important now, if we can't use it directly through an LDR to preserve these open spaces, then I challenge you to look at what other tools you have available um, from the city council perspective. Thank you. Someone else? Yes. Uh, um, oh, I'm sorry, Brad and then Andrew. Okay. Uh, I have a question if I'm... Brad, will you um, Brad tell us Garber. who you are? Yeah. Um, if I started a development before, I can rezone that now or come back in for a meeting? Um, if there was a, so the point in time that everything matters for the purposes of, of this conversation is when there's a preliminary plat submitted. So if there's a preliminary plat that was submitted prior to any regulation coming into effect, whether it's interim zoning or a new set of regulations that's that's the day in which that's those are the regulations in effect if the preliminary plat is submitted uh, or site plan is submitted after a, a new bylaw has been um, warned or council has adopted in terms zoning then that's in effect so that would be that's the timeline that is relevant so I can't come back in I don't know where your project was that's why I'm <clears throat> generalities Heinsberg uh, Road right I, I, I know I know physically where the project is but I'm not sure where in the timeline it was if it if it's so not you can, actively you can in front check of the with that yeah okay. but if it's not actively in front of the DRB it's probably not um, vested unless it got it previously in approval okay. all right thank you Andrew Hi, uh, my name is Andrew Tonic. Um, I just have two observations, suggestions. So I was on the TDR committee, so familiar with you know our thought process. And um, uh, from our perspective, I don't, I don't really think there was confusion. And I, I think it's probably unanimous among that folks on the committee that we understood the open space committee would be identifying highest priority parcels. And we said un unanimously, those parcels should become sending areas. At a minimum, at a minimum, they should no longer be receiving TDR density. The Open Space Committee identified those parcels as a whole, right, using biofinder science as important parcels to conserve. At a minimum, they shouldn't be receiving TDR density. And I don't think there was any confusion in the committee as to how that should work. Um, the second thing I would suggest is that, um, you know, I was a little concerned, just echoing Kelly's comments, that it doesn't seem the Planning Commission is really taking into account the results of the Open Space Committee. And one other way it seems to me to link it up would be the parcels identified as highest priority should automatically become conservation POTs, right? Because there's, there's lots of resources on those parcels that have not been identified as level one, level two. There's all the repairing areas and all the fields that, you know, uh, for pollinators, for raptors, for amphibians, for uh, you know, uh, water filtration, all really, really important attributes 
of those parcels, which the open space committee took into account, that's not really you know, well defined in the level one and level two resources. And for that reason, those parcels should be conservation priorities. Someone else? Yes, in the back. Hi. So my name is Jen Marway, and um, although I would say that I think interim zoning should end because I think people's lives are just being affected, I, I don't really see how that can really occur today based on what I'm looking at. I do have a, con a concern that the city council put out a charge of wanting to have all of these open space and TDR committees and Arrowhead and all these committees come through so that they have a really good vision for the, the city. Mm -hmm. um, and I look at the Arrowhead report and the open space report and they almost mirror each other. Um, but then I look at planning and zoning and it's completely different. They've added, um, they didn't put in a lot of what you know the city council had as their by changing the 12A or 12B or whatever it is, they didn't add in a lot of um, the things into hazards in level one and level two that the city council felt was important, like forest blocks, like we just talked about. Um, but they added in instead slopes and steep slopes, which completely, if you look at the map, is about almost half of what is pink and red. And it's, it's not uh, something that the city council had on their list of like what's important. But it is important to the planning and zoning and that's, that's concerning to me. It's also concerning to me that we look at the list, um, the planning and zoning was talking about anything that's considered a hazard or level one um, or a natural resource not receiving a TDR because the way that they looked at it was that they shouldn't, you couldn't build there so there shouldn't be a TDR. That's very concerning to me that all these people are gonna lose all their TDRs that have now also been in interim zoning. So they get that they couldn't, it, it just is changing the values of these properties hugely. Um, so I would say that I, I realize that interim zoning is probably gonna go a little longer than it currently is, but I would ask the city council to maybe either really kind of put together a charge as to if, there, if this was what the point of interim <coughs> zoning is, is what your charge was, why is it not mirroring up with what planning and zoning is doing? It seems to be mirroring up with what you're seeing on the other committees, but not planning and zoning. So I think there's like currently <coughs> a really big um, disconnect. And last piece is that when you look at the um, open space committee, they have, you know, level, they have the 25 that they showed in blue or the 20 parcels, something that are highest priorities. Mm -hmm. But they have others in there that are, I don't know if it's level one or level five, but like they're really important. And those aren't being shown on that list. So part of what you're seeing in white as being able to be developed is not. Because when you look at open space committee, they are not, there's natural resources there. There's things that they want to do. But it's not listed in their hazards because it's not, the forest blocks and the other things from the arrow report. So they're not all coming together. So what you're looking at is, oh, look, there's still more space to develop, but there's there's not when you start putting all the reports on. I don't know how else to say that, but so. Okay. All right, thank you. Anyone else? Yes, Kevin. Langfell with O'Brien Brothers. Um, this is kind of a, a general and kind of a broad statement, but while open space is certainly a priority of the city and of the comprehensive plan and should be of the Planning Commission, there are other priorities as well that also need to be considered, housing being one of them. And by keeping interim zoning in effect, and by the way, our property at O'Brien Brothers is not impacted, so this is, again, mm -hmm. an unbiased uh, opinion here. By keeping interim zoning in place, it's only exacerbating our housing crisis. A week and a half ago, an article came out by The Economist comparing the, Bur the Greater Burlington area to San Francisco to being one of the hardest areas in the country to develop new housing. Look at how that is impacting the community. There's a, like I said, there's a lot of objectives in the comprehensive plan, open space being one, but there are others. 
access to housing and affordability should be contemplated when you're making this decision. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Yes, Leo. My name is Leo Nato, and I've uh, been a resident here in South Burlington for, I'd say, close to 50 years, and obviously love it and hope to continue here for a while longer. But in reference to interim zoning, one thing that concerns me is that uh, my understanding is some folks in this room on the council have indicated in the past that uh, the reason for establishing it was due to the overload on our emergency services and infrastructure in South Burlington. Um, I, along with many people that I know, feel that the real overload to our city are and will continue to be created from areas outside the SEQ. So with the high rises that are going to be built, the hotels that are going to be built in this community, that's going to have major impact, already is. I checked with the representative from the fire department and police department. They informed me by far most of their requests for services has occurred outside the uh, SEQ. So I think it's important that the board in the future, when you're talking about interim zoning, the, why, the reason for it to be enacted, is just you shy away from saying that it's because of the impact that the SEQ is having on the police services and the infrastructure. Because to be honest, that is not the case, and I think a lot of people would agree with you. The data that would be collected from the police department and fire department would also reflect that. So that would be my, my point. Hey, just to let you know, we are going to have an update after this from Kevin. We are having a, um, a study done to really look at that, the cost of development versus conservation to address some of those concerns. I, I agree with you. The, the committees we've heard from and the reports don't touch on that, but that wasn't their, um, what we asked them to do. But this other report, we hope, will give us some helpful information to um, um, drive our policy correctly. And your um, conclusion may be what the report f finds. I don't know. Thank you, Helen. But thank you. Oh, uh, yes, I'm sorry. My name is Daryl and Peters. I'm very short. Um, and all I wanted to say is I've watched as all of the citizens have. This is a really hard thing you're doing. This is hard work. You've had all of your work and your meetings, all of these citizens, all of these committees. And you announced when you created IZ that it would be for naught if you didn't end up with actionable items, updated and revised LDRs, that if we just got more paper to put in the file cabinet, that would be a terrible conclusion. So what I'm asking us all to do is to have a little more patience. It's hard. This is really hard. Everybody wants to, you know, get it done, get it off the table, go on to other things. But there's been a huge investment in dealing with hard issues and trying to think about it from all aspects of the community. And it deserves the respect of everybody, a respect for that work that's been done to get to the point where we have actionable items. In the great history of recorded time, it's not that long. And we need to do this. So that's just a passion, passionate request that you please just everybody give them a little more time. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Anyone else? Yes, I can't see the face with the hand. Yes, Sarah. My 
My name is <clears throat> my name is Sarah Dopp. Um, I think the case has been made very, very clearly by Jessica and others from the Planning Commission about the need for more time. Um, you folks have just worked enormously hard to get us to this point. So I think that point is um, is well made, and I don't need to really reiterate it. Um, as to the housing, the need for housing and the need for affordable housing, I think the affordable housing thing has been kind of co-opted. Um, I think it's something of a red herring in a way, because who could be against affordable housing? I'm certainly not. But I don't think it needs to be built in our natural areas. Um, so the amount of affordable housing that would be built in conjunction with additional development projects is fairly minimal, and it will be the absolute minimum that they can get away with. And many of us feel that the formulas that are developed by the state to define affordability don't square up very well with the ordinary person's actual day-to-day -day existence and income and the amount they can spend on housing. Uh, an affordable house is not necessarily what's defined as affordable to many of us. So I think that whole thing is is being co-opted in a way uh, by the development community to uh, argue for a segment of the community's interests as opposed to the people who live here. Um, the other one point that I wanted to make was that I too have been around here an awful long time, since 1951. Um, I haven't been involved with city affairs for more than about 20 years other than voting. But in that time, when I started to be involved, you would come to a meeting like this and there might be one member of the public present. There was total apathy, total unwillingness to get involved. And now we've turned that around to our credit as a community and a lot of people are involved. Many people spend enormous amounts of their personal time um, in these committees, both interim and ongoing committees. Uh, they provide a wonderful public service for us all, and we should be thankful for it. Um, so I would hate for us to throw this back in their faces by saying, thanks for the work. Uh, we'll just move on now. Thank, Thank you. you. <clears throat> Um, hello, I'm Leslie McKenzie. I own Coldwell Banker, Hickok, and Mormon Realty, and own a property in South Burlington. And uh, I, I don't think anyone has to co opt the, the issue about affordable housing or housing in general. I think we truly have both an affordability crisis going on in Chittenden County and in South Burlington in northern Vermont. Um, we have a housing crisis in terms of the availability of housing. And I think uh, delays, even well intentioned, are just continuing to add to it. And this isn't an issue that just developed this year. This has been one that's going on for the last 10 to 20 years. And uh, although well intentioned, I think unfortunately it just continues to get worse. So we live in a community with less than 2% vacancy for people looking for rentals. We live in a community that there's uh, bidding wars on almost anything that anyone would consider affordable in the marketplace, and that's probably 350 to 400,000 and under. There was just a, a um, group of forums that were put together by the Vermont Futures Project, a group that's looking to try and really create economic vitality for Vermont for the long haul. And they gathered group of young, groups of young professionals to get together. And the biggest challenge, and why 40% or more say that they're going to move out of the community, is because of um, the gap between what people can make and what they can afford to buy. They came up with a cost of living challenge assessment of where the typical Vermont young family of three is right now. And that's saying that their median income is in the $80,000 range. And that allows about $1,400 a month for housing with the other obligations that they have. And I think most of us would look around and say there isn't housing available. You can't get a two bedroom um, apartment for uh, $1,400 often in South Burlington or in uh, northern Vermont, and that would give you buying power of around 250,000. Right now there's probably two, two properties in South Burlington on the market for 250 and below. And uh, the availability is only getting more challenging. So the realities of what they can afford, of where we can live, um, 
aren't there. And I don't think this is an issue that's just about people wanting to move in and people feeling threatened about who wants to join their community. It's people who live here and want to make changes or want to be able to move to a house where they can raise a family versus what they currently live in. I think it's affecting really everybody in the community, not just certain groups. But I think delays continue to exasperate the problem. And I think we should be greatly concerned that um, our demographics are getting more and more challenged and that uh, it affects our schools, it affects our quality of life. And so I ask you just to give strong consideration to quality of life on all aspects. And I think how we live and where we live is an important aspect of that. So whether it's a decision you make tonight or decisions that you make in the coming months as you continue to look at this. I hope you take that strongly into consideration. Thank you. Thank you very much. Duncan Murdoch. Um, I was on the uh, Open Space Committee, and um, I just hope that uh, you take our work, all our hard work, into account, and you make some um, some solid um, decisions around that, um, uh, and uh, do that in the amount of time that you need to do it. I'd I'd, I'd hate to see that you know everything end just uh, now or soon, and not have those incorporated. I also just want to say that uh, we're a community um, of, um, and there's such a thing as natural communities. So we're not the only community here. Um, there are other species here. Um, and we're talking about where are we going to live? Uh, we need to talk about where are all the other species going to live and how can we accommodate them? We need to talk about not only how are we going to use these natural resources, which I don't like the term, but how are we going to give back to these so-called resources? What are we doing to enhance our natural communities? Right now, we're taking. Um, and um, one way uh, to do that is through conserving large areas of land. Um, for those other species um, that are out there that we live with. We're not the only species. Um, and so large areas for habitat, and it happens, could happen to be large areas for us to uh, find our um, peace and quiet and to restore our well-being. Um, so I really hope that you take that into account um, and um, this conversation continues, and I think that we need more time to, to do that in a, in a very deliberate way. So thank you for listening. Thank you. Is there anyone else? Yes. Hi, um, I'm J uh, Jeff Nick. I didn't plan to speak today, um, but um, what I'm hearing about the open space plan um, does give me some concerns. Um, it's been somewhat vague as to how this plan is going to be used. Um, and I did a little research. I looked back in the history of South Burlington. It looks like you've spent over the years about $3.8 million to preserve about five properties in town over the last 20 years. The open space plan looks like it contains properties that could be worth upwards of $100 million. So I'm not sure how you're going to preserve those properties. Um, it might appear, in listening to what's been said tonight, that there's a, a kind of a backdoor taking going on and uh, that these properties will be remain open through a <coughs> regulatory process that's still unknown. So that's my concern. I think there might be some other concerns similar to mine. But um, it'd be nice uh, to understand how this plan is going to be used. Um, and in the last four or five meetings I've attended, I haven't really gotten a clear answer to that question. So thank you. Thank you. Yes. I'm Frank Kochman. I'm a former member of the DRB. I'd like to address 
points made by two of the previous speakers. Sarah spoke about <clears throat> developers co-opting the issue of affordable housing. My, con my concern is I am distressed by the polarization between what look to be two what I like to think of as beneficent communities, the affordable people concerned with affordable housing and people concerned with preservation of natural areas. Uh, it is, there is some truth to what Sarah said. Uh, using the term co-opting, however, I find divisive and unhelpful. It is true that a developer who simply wants to enlarge his development can do a minimal amount of so-called of, of housing that is defined as affordable within a very, at a, at a very fairly high level of income. And he shouldn't be allowed to use that as a weapon against the intelligent preservation of natural areas. On the other hand, the reality is not addressed at all by this city for the most part, uh, is that real affordable housing housing affordable to people who really can't afford a place to live can't be accomplished these days without subsidy. And that's what should be fostered when you're talking about affordable housing, real subsidy. Subsidy that, a work, that is enough so that a, per, a working person has a decent place to live, not a $1,600 a month apartment for two people, for example. Uh, the other thing I wanted to address was that the other, what the other gentleman said, the gentleman who just spoke. Uh, I think that the, the report that I've looked at is useful as, a, um, as an inventory. That's a very, very useful exercise to the extent that it reflects a point of view, which I think it does in many places. I find it less useful. When he talks about $100 million worth of property and a backdoor taking, that has some resonance. I think you need to be very careful as you go forward not to put yourself, I'm sorry, <coughs> inadvertently because you can't afford to buy the parcel, parcels in a position of essentially unconstitutional takings through a backdoor regulatory process. You need to be careful about what you regulate. So regulating entire parcels out of development would be a bad idea, for example. That's one way to read what's being advocated. I hope that that's not what you're doing. You can have reasonable regulations that require people with sensitive, with sensitive areas within a parcel to take appropriate steps. But if you can't afford to buy the parcel, you can't substitute for that what amounts to a confiscatory taking. I think that's the concern that the gentleman was expressing. I share that concern. Uh, I close by urging everyone to take a close look at affordable housing, a reasonable look, not line up in two opposite camps, understand that from the standpoint of, the afford of, of, of land affordability, you're going to have to open up some of the land you're talking about to make it available for genuine affordable housing. Thank you, Frank. Anyone else? Yes. Yes, Roseanne? I can't really see everyone's head, so <coughs> just their hands. <clears throat> Uh, my name is Roseanne Greco. I'm a resident of South Burlington. Um, thank you very much, uh, counselors, for taking this on. This is not a pleasant duty. Um, it's, um, um, but it's crucial and it's important. Uh, I urge you to take a broad view, a long-term view. We're talking about um, our lives, our sustenance. We're talking about planetary change. We're talking about climate disruption. All the things that we need to live um, are given to us on the land. If we pave it over, we don't have those. Uh, Duncan mentioned about communities. We're not the only ones living here. Um, and so I hope that when you make your decisions, you keep the big picture. We talk a lot about economy. We should be talking more about ecology. Uh, there are things that are wants. There are things that are needs. We need clean air. We need clean water. We need good soil. Uh, so I urge you to keep that in mind. Um, 
I went through today and I pulled out, I don't have enough time to read them, but here are all the reports that were done with taxpayer dollars, very good reports. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12. There's about 13 reports here. All of these are have to do with our open spaces. Some are narrowly focused, uh, like on the, the birds, uh, or there were some early ones here on our trees. Um, your most recent report, the Arrowwood report, was a focused on habitat block. Some of them are broad brush, uh, give the whole, the whole environment. Um, the most recent one is the most comprehensive, and that was done by the Interim Zoning Open Space Committee that looked at the, the magnitude of the natural resources. Um, for the first time, they actually gave you a prioritized list. Uh, all these other ones um, talked about it. What all these reports have in common is t they say that our open lands are precious, they're vital, they're essential, and they urge the city to preserve them. But as the reports goes on, they also make comments that there's fewer and fewer areas to preserve. They were never codified. Most of these were never codified. You did the natural resource protection areas, but that's not conserving or preserving them, that's one zoning vote away from them being developed. So the area that's actually legally conserved and preserved is very, very small. So I brought these up here to show you, please don't make this report just added to the pile that action never gets taken on because first of all, we're gonna run out. This will probably be the last interim zoning because we're running out of land. As you look at what the first report was back in May of uh, 1972, a mini blueprint for the Southeast. I guess it didn't call a quadrant in those days. True. If you go and you see what we had then and you see what we have now, there won't be much left. So I urge you not to just add the Arrowwood or the IZ report to the pile and it goes on a shelf and nothing ever gets enacted. Um, so, and thank you very much for doing this. Thank you. Is there, yes, is there anyone else besides this gentleman? Come, come on up. Are there others? Me. Oh, you want to make a comment? Okay. I mean, yeah, that's fine. Good evening. My name is Daniel Seff, a 14-year resident of South Burlington. First, I want to thank everybody for their service to the city and the hard work and the late nights and everything that you do uh, to make the city a better place, so thank you. Uh, I do want to respond directly, if I may, to a question raised by Mr. Chittenden, which is whether there's going to be a scramble, I think that was the word that was used, um, of applications for development if IZ is lifted. And I have uh, some firsthand information and knowledge on that that I think may be useful to the council. I think the answer is yes, and I'll tell you why. Uh, I personally, I'm an attorney in the area, and I'm personally handling two cases right now on behalf of neighbors who are opposing projects that were filed just under the wire of IZ. One, the last time IZ was adopted, and this current one. So it's absolutely, you can take it to the bank. If IZ is lifted, there's gonna be a scramble to have applications for development filed before the regulations are changed. So I feel confident in saying that, and you can expect it. Two, there is a real problem right now in the city uh, on the subject of TDRs that needs to be worked out and resolved before IZ is lifted. And let me address that briefly. I've been looking at the question of TDRs for over 10 years. In fact, in 2010, I went before the city council and I said that the 2006 TDR bylaw was unconstitutional and should be reformed. Nothing happened. A group of neighbors hired me and my firm. We challenged the bylaw. 2019, the court struck it down as unconstitutional. We have a problem right now where the current TDR bylaw, which was adopted in 2019 in response to that court decision, makes areas in the southeast quadrant receiving areas for TDRs that are actually parcels that have been identified by the Open Space Committee as highest priority for preservation. It's completely incongruous, it's completely counterintuitive to have a high priority conservation area be a receiving area for TDRs. This needs to be worked out. The TDRIZ committee has come up with some great suggestions about having TDRs being sent out of the SEQ into areas along 
uh, population corridors. And that needs to be, I think, looked at and resolved before IZ is lifted. Otherwise, what's going to happen is there are going to be more applications for uh, precious open spaces in Southeast Quadrant being built with excess density. So it, yes, there's going to be a bum rush of applications, and we're going to have the parcels that the committee identified as being highest priority for preservation overbuilt with excess TDRs if you do lift IZ before the TDR issue is worked out. And I'm happy to answer any questions on this subject. I've been looking at it for over 10 years. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Michael Mitigy wants to speak, and then um, why, don't, why don't you come up first, and then, because you'll have a chance. And is there anyone else I'd, I'd like to? We've gone a little bit longer, but I think it's important to have any, everyone speak who wishes to. So if there's anyone who still wants to speak, please let me know so we can manage this. Sandy, you want to? Okay, so it's, okay. Janet? Hi, Janet Bellavance. Um, thank you for taking the time to listen to the people and balancing conservation and development, development is daunting. And we understand the many forces that um, you have to play against and reconcile. Um, and we applaud you imposing interim zoning to address the challenges thoughtfully and hope that you extend it tonight to ensure that all the study information is synthesized and considered for new regulations to be put in place. Um, we hope you use the committee research as well as the Arrowhead report to take action and envision the future of our city. On another note, in response to a couple of issues that have been brought up, I believe that affordable housing is a national issue, as is wage stagnation. It's a shared responsibility of towns in Chittenden County, us being one of them. Um, and also in response to how will we pay for open land or high priority land, uh, the South Burlington Land Trust um, came up with a proposal and spent many hours on it, C for C, Sense for Conservation. And um, that's a proposal that we wanted to put forth to the voters, and at some point, hopefully, that can happen, and that the people will vote for what they value. The people will pay for what they value. And I think that's what this open public forum is about, hearing what people value and they're willing to pay for. So thank you for taking the time listening. Thank you. Sandy? <laughs> I'm Sandy Dooley. I live on East Terrace, and I've lived there since 1974. Um, just wanted to say a few words about sort of the interplay between um, the desire for open space and the need, and the need for open space preservation or natural resource preservation. I think is the way I look at it. Um, so and affordable housing. The, um, it's pretty clear from the people on our committee, affordable housing committee, that interim zoning does depress the, the production of housing and therefore um, results in, and actually exacerbates the cost of housing, but that may be a price that we're willing to pay for our goals right now. But I just wanted to say a few words about affordable housing. The inclusionary zoning rules are one tool and they, their primary goal is inclusion. That is that all of our neighborhoods will at least have some um, housing that is affordable to a range of incomes, maybe not all of them. Uh, and they're focused on what, with the incentives that are provided, which right now are offsets um, in terms of increased density, that a private developer can build uh, without subsidy. Um, I certainly agree that there are families within our community that uh, can't afford the prices that interim zoning, um, in inclusionary zoning, um, targets uh, because um, they they don't they aren't subsidized, but we do recognize that the nonprofits have to be involved, and the place the city has 
address that is the creation of the housing trust fund. Uh, so I do think that we also need to, uh, it has provided some funding for um, affordable housing that is subsidized and therefore it reaches uh, families that are like 60% of the area median income or 50% or 70%. Um, the area that inclusionary is focusing is um, for rentals under 80% of area median income for ownership up to 100% of area median income. So I think one of the things we need to think about in the future is more money in the housing trust fund because one of the major costs of development of housing in South Burlington is the cost of land. And I know the nonprofits, both Cathedral Square, uh, we're going to have some habitat housing, thank God, um, in South Burlington, um, so on Heinsberg Road. Um, and um, Champlain Housing Trust would, would all partner and love to have our city have um, more money in our housing trust fund. So that's, I just want to speak for that need. But I think we, we need to work to find ways that these two goals complement each other. And I think that's possible. Thank you. Okay. I think, Michael, you wanted to make a uh, statement? Yes. Um, we've, unless there's somebody else who wants to go, I'm in a privileged position. I think that was it. From the I'm in a privileged position here. <laughs> um, so before we close this, uh, I just wanted to uh, say that it's worth remembering that interim zoning was enacted in response to a very strong demand by a majority of South Burlington residents who felt that South Burlington <coughs> was developing too rapidly and especially development in our remaining open lands and wanted those lands saved from, from development or conserved in some way. Um, the work of the Open Space Committee and the TDR Committee, if it doesn't lead to some form of regulatory outcome, we might as well junk it. And the two years of work that have gone into it uh, by many, many volunteers, hours and hours of work, night times, homework galore. Um, so it's, it's very important that uh, interim zoning be extended so that these, at least the interim, uh, the TDR committee uh, can complete its, its work and draft, have draft regulations uh, by the end of, of uh, IZ. Um, it's the open space committee and the TDR committee are really the only ones that can produce some meaningful land conservation. The PUD won't do it, although a conservation PUD will perhaps conserve some land in a particular development. And inclusionary zoning won't do it, much as we need it. So um, if we don't do something with what we've, what we've produced, <coughs> if we don't use the Open Space Committee, and I, I understand now that it's been sidelined, but I think it's a mistake, I mean, the Earth Economic Study is based on the parcels identified by the Open Space Committee. Um, the parcels, the habitat blocks in the Arrowwood Habitat Block Study uh, in part overlap with the, with the parcels identified by the, by the uh, Open Space Committee. <coughs> so um, ignoring that work, and, and somebody else said, putting it in the filing cabinet and forgetting about it, uh, would be a tragedy. So I'm asking the, <coughs> we'll ask the Planning Commission again, extend interim zoning, otherwise we've done this time what we did last time, and that, that would be a, a, a terrible tragedy. Thank you. <laughs> so if there, Helen, to yeah. clarify one thing, if I, if I might. Yeah. Um, a couple of folks spoke about the work of the Open Space Committee as identifying lands that should never be developed, and that was never the intent of the charge to the Open Space Committee. The Open Space Committee was charged with identifying lands that had 
the most valued natural resources in the city from a critter, wildlife corridor, water, and vegetation perspective, and they did quite the stellar job with that, but it was never in the intent to say that these lands should never be developed. Even Alan, um, if I might quote you, is what I read in the paper, if a development has to go on one of these parcels, anything we can do to minimize the damage to natural resources is really important in thinking about not only following regulations, but also trying to think about doing this in a way that's as carefully crafted as possible. So all I'm saying, maybe we can find ways to buy some of these lands, but only if there's money available to do that or a creative way to do that. Um, otherwise, otherwise, what happens on those lands um, will happen according to regulations. But at no time, I want to be clear, and I think everybody should understand, did we intend to say, um, or did we even hint at saying, those open spaces should never be developed. Um, and I, I just thought it was important to, uh, to clarify that. Okay. Yeah. Um, I, I didn't say, and I, <clears throat> I meant to, that landowners and developers also have this, the same concerns that all of us have about conservation, mitigation of climate change, and, and global warming. Uh, and so that when I say we should have a, le a regulatory outcome, that doesn't mean that there cannot be any compromise. There may well be compromise with a landowner and a developer who understands the value, the ecological value of the land and might agree after negotiation that X amount of this will be conserved for ecological reasons. It's not a, it's not a black and white situation. There are opportunities mm -hmm. to work with landowners and developers for a better outcome than we've seen so far. Thank you. Um, if there are no other... Yes. So this is what, and how far out are we from that? Because I feel like that is what is happening <laughs> in that that completely changes open, like is what each of these communities did. So I just would be curious if that's, you know, a year out, then I see that over there. No, went good. back in front of you. Yeah. <coughs> that was the hundred and. Yeah. And 35 um, days or so whatever? So that was on the schedule I showed earlier. We're hoping like 140 days, I think it was, like, so like June. So kind of have that conversation earlier? Because I feel like part of that is that open space and, and TDRs, they all have one thing that they're focusing on. And then the planning commission <coughs> is adding in their own scope of what they would like added to these hazard areas which then completely changes what you're going to be able to develop later. So it, I mean, yeah, well, I, I, I think the, the work of the Planning Commission is a, a little broader than the reports from um, IZ. The reports from IZ were intended to provide some really good information. Um, you know, Tom's been talking forever about, I want to know where the really important natural resources are in our community because then we can potentially have a plan and a process to potentially save that, purchase it, do something um, with that so that the Lake Champlain doesn't continue be, to be um, denigrated. We have, um, uh, we avoid uh, catastrophic um, <coughs> runoff and flooding from different, um, things that happen, um, that we have a handle on that. And so, but that alone wasn't all that the Planning Commission, I mean, I think some of those um, our regulations hopefully will take into consideration what we learn, both with that and the economic um, uh, report. But uh, I think they're, they're um, connected but they're not, it's not all a set of LDRs. Well, 
comment on that. Uh, I agree. At times, I have supported this uh, open space report, and I still do have the reason to uh, be happy that we have a list of properties now. So if one of these 25 properties owners chooses to put it on the market mm -hmm. and sell it, now we can go to this list as a council and say, we have identified this as a piece of land. I know the Langs. They live across the street. They're one of the 25 parcels. Now I feel like if the Langs want to sell their land, uh, any council now or in the future could feel very good about a committing open space dollars to that. I'm very concerned if we try to purchase all 25 of these properties. It's just not feasible I know, for a no lot of the reasons that were offered previously. That, Tom. Yeah, yeah, I'm not saying that. But I, my point is this, I'm supporting that I, I like this list that we know and we can justify when something comes on the market when it's not the five of us sitting on this on the, in these seats. That somebody at some point in time, a collective group of individuals, said this is a parcel that we should acquire from the city. So if there's no other comments, um, I would entertain a motion to um, close the public so hearing. Moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. So we'll move on to, excuse me, to number eight, and that is the status report of studies related to the economic assessment of conservation and development. Kevin? Helen, my report's going to be very quick. Um, we expect to hear back with a draft report from Earth Economics, which is one half of the study, um, by the end of the week. And we expect to hear back from John Stewart, who's conducting the other half of the study for us uh, um, by the end of the month. So we'll have that both uh, pieces by the end of the month, this month. Okay, great. Question on that? Yes. Will those be publicly available? Um, yeah, I mean, they're going to be, yes, they'll be publicly available. If they're presented to us, they'll be yeah. publicly. You said by the end of the week, so it's something that can be shared. And oh. Um, I, I, before we put it out, I'd like Paul and I to have a chance to look at it and ask some questions, but we would put it up immediately upon understanding uh, what the, the Earth economics process, as far as I can see, is, is a little complicated. Um, but we absolutely are going to put it up so people can see it. Sooner or later. It'll yeah. Be oh, yeah. Okay. Absolutely. Right. Okay. Absolutely. And right. John Stewart's as well. Okay. And his is at the end of the month. Okay. And those are related to the parcels that were identified in open space. My remembrance well, some of is the them, top anyway. 20. The top 20. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, number nine, then. Um, determine actions and schedule follow-up um, meeting for additional work. You, are you um, taking that? Or? Sure, I'll, I'll start it maybe. Um, in preparing for this evening, uh, the commission did sort of a, a dry run on some of this about two weeks ago, and the feeling was that there's a lot in here. Um, and so the commission recommended that the not to try to put 10 pounds of flour in a five pound bag and do everything in one shot. And so there were uh, a few very important pieces that are not um, that, that sort of complement the book that Jessica presented tonight that um, they're recommending have some follow-up. The first is, um, Jessica alluded to the Arrowwood Environmental Habitat Block Assessment. Um, lots of great information in there uh, as part of their contract with us. Um, they are happy to give a presentation and answer questions about how they came up with their methodology. Um, the commission is recommending that this that a we do that, and if council is interested in having that be um, to both both groups, because uh, as proposed by the commission, it's a pretty foundational element of future regulations. Um, and then secondly, as Jessica said, um, there are a whole slew of, of there, there's areas from the open space report that are. Um, that are not proposed to be part of the land development regulations, but there are other tools um, for those parcels that council can begin to engage in. And what, how you want to go about doing that, um, whether you want to involve the planning commission or not, um, is really up to you with that. But there, there's a follow-on discussion for you about what are the tools uh, available to you for the remaining portions of those 25 parcels. Do you have a time frame of when you would like to meet with us to um, identify that? Well, you yeah, know, a pretty I, heavy schedule, <laughs> it seems, going yeah, forward. You know, it's a good question because I guess I, and it's actually written here in the agenda, <coughs> if I'm not part of the economic assessment, I'm not sure if that needs to be available first to kind of be part of that conversation or not. And 
I mean, I think that's maybe separate. Um, that was valuing the natural capital mm -hmm. yeah. of 20 possible. So I guess I'm, I'm not clear on if we need to wait for that to have one, one discussion about all of it, or if we could talk over the parts we have now, which is the Arrowwood environmental and the open space and kind of non-LDR portions of the open space. And mm -hmm. maybe there's some TDR report recommendations that aren't necessarily in our purview. I don't know if you want to get into that, Jessica, too. But doesn't the economic assessment have more to do with city council decisions and not regulatory? Yeah, it I feels to me like that's not, a, mm -hmm. that's not our purview. It'd be, it'd be nice if we did it in the short term so that we can wrap up some of our work. Okay. So certainly the Arrowwood we would recommend as soon as possible because per that timeline there's no weeks to be lost and so if there's feedback on that report okay. ASAP. Yeah. I agree. I think Monica's right about the application of the economic report. Timeline's aggressive. I, I would it encourage you to, do, to move this along. Okay. Next week? Well we have a council meeting next Monday. Monday. What? Oh, Tuesday. 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 Excuse me. Monday is a President's Day. One of the presidents. One of the not even one of the presidents, right? <laughs> Isn't it presidents. just the day? Um, any it's any for all the presidents. Um, so, our agenda potentially could we talk about that on the seventeenth? I think it is. It's the, it would be the eighteenth. Because the Monday is the seventeenth. Okay. Kevin, what do you... 18th is Tuesday? Yeah. Yeah. Are you saying do it that night? Well, they want to sort of move on it pretty quickly. I downloaded it today and read part of it anyway. I think it, right now, <coughs> probably getting out about 9 o'clock on, on Tuesday in your, in your regular meeting. That's great. Well, that's pretty early for us. So the next, oh, is it? <laughs> the next Tuesday... That's our meeting. Is our meeting. That's our meeting. So it would be great to have feedback. You could do 18th. So you're saying 18th would be good. So yes, because then follow we can up on the 25th. Yeah. Okay. Well, why don't we plan on that? We can include it in the agenda and you know, 18th. 45 minutes or I don't know how long it will take. Yeah. Well, maybe, maybe we can trim the rest of the stuff in the yeah. 18th back a little bit. Okay. I mean, assuming everything. Arrowwood is not available. Arrowwood is not available. Okay. Well, twenty first is a Friday, but I can come. Twenty third is a Sunday. So um, they can come to our planning commission meeting. <coughs> can we come to their planning commission meeting on the twenty fifth? What day, Kathy? Do you have a uh, so there was debate? The, uh, the last email I have to announce we were going to hold the 21st, the 25th, through the 28th. And you've got a meeting on the 25th? 25th. Yes. Yeah. That we will. You're not available. So oh, 25th through the 28th? 28th? 25th through the 28th? 25th through the 28th. Well, oh, can we work on this offline and not do it in a yep. public setting trying to find well, a well, date? Well, as long as we know that was the next step of having yes. that meeting with yeah. you to do that. Okay. Or? We will find a time. Good. Okay. Thank you. Um, okay. Moving on to item 10. Consider and possibly approve extending interim zoning in those areas currently covered by interim zoning <coughs> for a three-month period. Although I think we're really focusing on the um, PUD's yes. main focus. Tom. So I'm just going to make my little statements uh, on this. Um, so I didn't, uh, I'm just going to jump to the punch here because we can get all out of here at a reasonable hour. But I didn't vote for IZ, so I'm not going to vote to continue it. And I just want the voters to know why. So what my rationale is. Um, I'm just, I'm not convinced that there will be a development scramble. Uh, the arguments I've heard tonight is that I haven't seen it. The, the statement that because there were two applications that 
came in just before IZ, which inspired IZ, that, that doesn't tell me that or prove to me that there's going to be a scramble when it ends. And I, everything you're doing, I love what you're doing with PUDs. This makes a lot of sense. Uh, I support the PUDs. I just I don't think IZ then is necessary, nor is it now. So I, I, could, I would not vote to extend it. I'm also concerned with the possible paths that these non-LDR approaches for conservation can go, could go. Um, I would echo Frank Copeman's statements. Um, the confiscatory taking. I have no reason to believe that we're definitely going to go down that path. I'm just hearing people call for it. So it's important to know that we calibrate expectations with the path that the council can and can't take. And I personally am not going to support any type of taking of personal assets because there are lawsuits that come to that and I, I hear stewarding the resources of this city. So I'm sensitive to those concerns. And I, I feel like it's important for the voters to hear that, that that's something that I'm very cautious of. And then lastly, I'm just really concerned that this process has not been balanced in the consideration of all of our competing interests. Um, so I think it's been very important and focused on open space. And if you look at our comprehensive plan, we also are opportunity oriented and we also focus on affordability. And so I just think those voices need to be heard as well. And I, I'm concerned as this goes forward that we're not weighing all of those different interests. So I'm not going to vote to extend in term zoning tonight because I don't think it was necessary to begin with. And uh, I just want to say that. But I'm not trying to convince this council because the more I try to convince them, the less convincing I am. So uh, that's just my statement and I'm going to be done. Okay, I would just assure you that Tom, even if, and I don't believe we are going down a path of um, confiscating people's land, um, it would always come before us for a vote. So you would always be able to say, I don't want this to happen. And I think you probably have four other counselors who would also say that's not the plan. That isn't what we anticipate. So, you know, Going forward with IZ might get us to the point where, where there is a um, positive or a um, purposeful regulation or policy that we adopt uh, around TDRs and all these other things that we would have public hearings about and you would have every opportunity to make your case. And I, I think we're all looking for something that really can work and meets um, not one single camp's view, but really, where's the middle? Where can we find a way to um, balance all those competing needs in a way that works for this community, even though it won't please everyone fully in this community? I mean, we talk about affordable housing, and I could if we had developers who were anxious to build 167 units of affordable housing, real affordable housing in this community, I would not be standing in their way. But that isn't what happens. So, I mean, I think, and I'm a big supporter of affordable housing. I was throughout my legislative career, and I am now. But I, I just don't see, I don't buy that IZ is preventing affordable housing from being built because the housing that is being built has, if it has any affordable component, it's a pretty slim job. And it's, so it's not meeting the need. We're building housing potential, but we're not building affordable housing to the extent that this county needs. So I, I think that's. Yes. And that we lost. In fact, I don't know if you mentioned 167 because that's the number of homes that we lost due to the airport taking. May I use that word? Yes, you um, may. And it is also housing that is irreplaceable. That is when the 3.3 vacancy rate fell below 2%. That was in 2017 because 100 homes were demolished that year. <coughs> so I just want that to be clear that IZ is not the reason why we're below 2% <laughs> vacancy rate. Um, and I also want to say that this council added affordable housing not to IZ but to this um, process when the Affordable Housing Committee came before this council asking us to look at transit areas, since that is something that we left open for development. 
and I thought the Planning Commission was going to delegate that to the CCRPC and lo and behold you've been spending uh, you know, a lot of time on, on very, making a very comprehensive um, plan and which we just received um, last week. So affordable housing has definitely not been forgotten here over all of these months and, and that I see as a real testament to us trying to you know, meet these complementary goals of our comprehensive plan. So I just wanted to say that. Hey, t uh, Tim. So, I mean, I just want to say I, I support extending the interim zoning for another 90 days. I, I was, I, a week ago I was going to come in here and, and not vote to extend it, but uh, because of the plan that was presented by Jessica, uh, Jessica for the Planning Commission, I just want to remind people that we went into IZ, the three main things we were looking for was this plan. All right, was the PUD master plan subdivision changes, right, to encourage smarter use of land that needed to be better conserved, all right? And, th and that was my number one priority for going into IZ. The second thing was a TDR analysis, because nobody understood how the TDR system worked. We had a really good report, and now we have some recommendations. I don't know if those will be able to be put into the LDRs before we come out of IZ or not. I'm not sure if that matters. We could probably all argue about that. The third thing was a, a very comprehensive analysis of our remaining open space so that we could probably work together as a city to understand what our options were for conserving them. That could be outright purchase, working with the land trusts in the state, other conservation agencies, and even the landowners themselves because some of them are conservation minded in the first place and they might even feel like putting that land into some kind of conversation them, uh, you know, themselves. So. We don't have $100 million right now to go conserve all that land unless you want to add it to the $209 million across the street, in which case then your taxes are going to go up uh, $2,500 for a $350,000 house over the next 30 years. Right? So and that's not going to happen. But there are a lot of other options out there. Right? And as far as housing starts, okay, let me review for you. Our grand list grew by 1% last year. Cider Mill has all of its foundations in the ground and they're framed or they're getting ready to be framed. South Village Phase 3 is ongoing and still building and so is Phase 2. Rye is ongoing and is still putting in foundations. Hillside Farm is building now. City Center added two four-story buildings worth of affordable housing, Senior Center and Affordable. Don't tell us we're not doing anything about housing and don't tell me that IZ has stopped any goddamn housing in the city. Right? I'm not done. I'm not done. Cider Mill, <laughs> Cider Mill 2 is through Act 250 and they're ready to go for financing. That's over 100 units. Granted, it's not affordable, right? But the point is, is that there is a lot of housing that is either in the ground, planned, or ready to go, and I haven't even talked about Spear Meadows and Dorset Meadows, which Mr. Seth knows very well about. So my point is that I will vote to extend because I want to see this PUD plan get put into the LDRs before we get out of IZ because it's the best way to do a smart reorganization of how we develop those remaining properties where there are people that have land that want to sell them and develop them. Okay? That's what I'm saying. Well, Madam can, Chair, could can, I make a comment? Can I go, well, can I go before you? Council, yes. This is the council. We'll get to your turn again. Yes. But I, but I haven't been sitting here as long as you have. <laughs> I don't have built on. Well, I'm not going to be as eloquent as you. That was pretty darn good. Yeah, well, but good uh, <clears throat> I don't know. I think I want to say, uh, taking of land is never going to happen. And uh, I don't know. I don't. I don't recall what prompted you to bring that up. But that's. Well, well, that's that's well, that's Dave, not going to happen. We don't I need to talk I about. I just say though, we've received about as a council 30 emails where residents are asking us to. Do that. So that's where no, it's no coming reason. from, Dave. I didn't I read. Show I you didn't. Them. So that's I'll fine. stop there. But that's okay. where it's coming from. I just want to reassure folks that that okay. would never right. happen as Glad long as this council is sitting where this council is sitting. Um, and, but I'd like to say I'm not overjoyed with the timeline the Planning Commission um, has in mind because I had hoped it'd be quicker than that. I kind of run out of patience on occasion. But I totally appreciate the hard work that the Planning Commission has done and they've tackled an extremely difficult project. They have uh, they've created opportunities to which, which have to be fine-tuned. It's still a work in progress, but they've created opportunities to both develop and conserve with the best possible outcomes. And the Planning Commission has done, in, in Michael's words, a very large, tackle a very large and challenging project that is just not quite done yet. 
And I think it's only appropriate the project be completed. My perception, based on, on, on what I've seen, what I've learned, and my experience is that development will proceed with better information when their work is complete. And better information always leads to better outcomes for all parties involved. And, and so I'm not concerned that there are going to be losers here. I think everybody's going to be a winner. And, um, and we need to wait to get that, that work done because the outcome's going to be best for everyone. Um, and, and I do sure hope you can complete that in 135 days. And um, to put a touch of humor at the end of this, 135 days, all of interim zoning, we're still going to have something in place a whole lot faster than the city of Burlington's filling that hole in the middle of the city. <laughs> That's for sure. So are you supporting a three-month extension or 135 days? we go 135 days? Well, they said they needed 135 days. Why don't we just go 135 days? Uh, I, Can we I, go I, three months? I don't know what we're allowed to do. I don't know what we're allowed to do. I think you're, the way you, d you adopted the original bylaw is doing three, three months, three month month increments at first. Okay. So I would propose that we do three months and then get another report with a status readout from the Planning Commission in some form or another about where you are and where you think you are in your schedule. Yeah, that's fine. Okay, good enough. Let's do that. So do we have, yes? Uh, I just want to pick up on something that uh, Council of <coughs> said, which is priority one PUD, priority yeah. two PUDs. Uh, the Planning Commission has worked on the PUD project for four years, and we have Paul, Connor, and Kathy Ann, LaRose, and one consultant to do all this work. There's no way in hell they can get it done. They need help. They're understaffed. They don't have the technical expertise that they can r rely on, other consultants. Uh, there's just not enough uh, manpower to get this done, to get both of those items done in 90 days. <coughs> so I'm making a plea to the council. Help them. Okay. We hear you. So I would entertain a motion to extend IZ for three months? So moved. Second. Okay. Is there any further discussion? All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed? Aye. Okay, it passes four to one. Thank you very much. Is there any other business to Can come I ask before? a quick question? Yes. Because Michael brought up a point they need extra assistance. If they were able to hire somebody or somebody's for a short duration of time to provide that extra assistance for specific projects, would that speed you up? Or is that impractical at this point? <laughs> I'm just asking because then my next question, if you said yes, I'd ask Kevin if we can pry loose any money from somewhere to, to help that process okay, we're, along. We're still in session, so would you please leave quietly? So, David, can... I, think what it, I, I think what it could do is it could help to advance that slide that had all the stuff about what to evaluate with TDRs. That would certainly help advance that. The PUDs is basically drafting at this point. So on the TDR piece, right if now, if there was, plan is to, I can't hear you. Our plan is to tackle it after that. I know that. Would it be better to tackle it sooner, or doesn't it matter? I don't. Go ahead. Well, I mean, considering it's part of your original charge, and we don't have the people power to continue doing it and still make this. Happen. I think we need help. Great. Well, we have, I mean, it's important to know there is an existing TDR program in existence today. Whether or not it's the best plan we could have is another question that the committee has addressed. But the reality is you have a TDR program today. Which will go back to the Supreme Court probably in it, years. It may. It may, but we think that you've made changes in the TDR program that can withstand Congressional or uh, constitutional challenge. That being said, the program needs to be improved. Um, but as it relates to the priority between the PUD project and the TDR project, I think you know the answer to that question with the PUD. So Paul's looking at them in secret. Yeah, I agree. Okay, that as, as presented. Fine. So is there any other business? All right, so I would hey, entertain a motion to adjourn. All in favor? Aye. Aye.